Thanks so much indeed. Thanks for the kind invitation and thanks to the organizers for all the effort and sweat of setting up this wonderful conference now as a kind of virtual conference in these awkward times. I hope you're all healthy and fine. So this talk will be concerned with what is commonly accepted as being very important, is still sometimes underappreciated and then sometimes seen as a necessary evil, which is the topic of benchmarking, certification and tomography with applications for quantum technologies in mind. This, however, in a particular flavor that might at first sound somewhat esoteric, that of semi-device independent characterization. I would like to argue this talk yet that this is how one should naturally think about benchmarking and certification in the first place. And here is what this is all about. Now, clearly, in particular, at such a conference showcasing all kinds of new results, recent years have seen an enormous progress in developing schemes for quantum simulation and computation. Quantum simulators offer new insights into strongly correlated quantum systems under large levels of control, not quite enough to be give rise to universal quantum computational schemes, but in a way that very large system sizes become available. Say with cold atoms and optical lattices systems with 10 to the power of 5 or even 6 atoms, that is to say qubits, are readily available. But then obviously equally rapid progress has been made in developing universal quantum computers in a way that seemed quite inconceivable not very long ago here. Smaller system size can be achieved naturally. We had a 53 qubits, but that at very accurate control. And still, any of those devices produce outcomes, numbers, data. At the end of the day, um, we need to have good answers to the question, um, right, but how do we know that the device is doing the right thing? That is, depending on the particular fine print, the questions of benchmarking, certification and tomography. And this is what this is the topic of this talk. We just put out a review on the topic some time ago on that rather comprehensively gives an overview over the field. This is not what is attempted here. Instead, we will have a look at a single yet, I think, quite important aspect that is in any of this, the assumption of having perfect detectors is unreasonable. Um, the circuits will not be, and so will the detectors and, in fact, any component. This is inspired by fault tolerant readings, where one does not assume any component to be perfect, and still quantum computing is conceivable. Now, one can be very stringent about this and take the perspective that all there ever is is data alone with no trust levels whatsoever. This is the paradigm of device independent settings. They're really honest, they're exciting and, and cute, but also very pessimistic after all. So perfect detectors are unreason, unrealistic and device independence may be way too stringent. So can we think of notions of semi device independence or, or dependence for that matter. So notions that are reasonably taking a middle ground. That is to say, uh, can we characterize quantum devices under realistic assumptions? This is not an easy task and there are several challenges. There's the um, curse of dimensionality um, that in fact Hilbert space are very large. So can, can structure help here? In fact, we will see that some structure is reasonable and needed to get some recovery at all in some meaningful. Um, and in the last part of the talk, if time allows, well, it, it surely does in, in this um, virtual format, I suppose. Um, so if the, if the machine is outperforming classical ones and is achieving a quantum advantage or quantum supremacy, although this term has fallen somewhat in disfavor recently, how can we ever certify the entire device and can be sure about it. These will be the, the guiding questions in this talk when we meander through our scheme. And let's start with what could be called optimal quantum gate tomography and start with something completely different. So let's assume someday you're going to a church and somebody is playing the organ in the church. And I would like to find out what tune this person is playing. 
How can you find that out? Well, one way of doing that is to um, is to place a, um, a piezo at every organ pipe and measure in frequency space. This is surely possible, then you would record what tune is played at a given instance in time, but this is also very expensive when you like think of these um, many uh, pipes that an organ um, has. Then one can also measure in the time domain and simply sample the signal. That's what like record companies would do when they um, sample the, the signal, they would take a discrete spacings that, the spacing that has to be one over omega 2 omega apart if omega is the highest frequency that can appear at the signal and say if you have these mini organ pipes sitting at the corner of the of the organ then this is again uh, quite costly so that's again a possibility but quite costly can you do better well surely not that that's um, Shannon Nyquist's theorem that you can't do better for, for a general signal but a moment of thought reveals that this is not a general signal. After all, this person has like 10 fingers and two feet. So there's at most 12 frequencies present in the signal. So can one make use of the sparsity in frequency when trying to recover the signal? And one might think, uh, no, one does not know the sparsity pattern if, and finding it out would be measuring the frequencies, which is expensive. So one cannot use it, but this is fortunately, um, fortunately wrong. And this is the, um, statement of uh, compressed sensing that's um, very easy to, to capture and maybe not as easy to, to, to prove that a measurement of not d but log d or of the order r log d random times will give the signal well not with not deterministically but with high probability if you just randomly sample amplitudes and um, uh, the recovery will be um, exact if the data is exact it will be robust so if you perturb the data a bit it will be give rise to a close recovery and the the recovery is also efficient in that you just minimize a an L1 norm given the, the signal that's that you have and there's no fine print this is clearly an um, enormous uh, improvement over naive um, recoveries that's the statement of compressed sensing 1o of sparse recovery with um, random uh, measurements what is sometimes called compressed sensing 2o is the is the natural matrix version of compressed sensing where one asks how many matrix entries are needed to recover an unknown matrix. And this problem has risen to prominence, I suppose, with the uh, famous Netflix prize, a significant award that was um, uh, put forth by Netflix, a video online and streaming uh, service that offers loads of uh, movies to be uh, streamed or, or downloaded. and that wanted to find out what movies people like. So they store a, a, a taste matrix where users can rate the quality of, of uh, movies and for obvious reasons, like as an, as like an incentive in, in, in advertisements say, they would like to know what movies people like. And obviously they can store lots of data, but this this uh, taste matrix of people rating movies will be very sparse indeed, as nobody can uh, watch all movies. And their question is and was, uh, how can one complete this incomplete matrix? And the first thought would again be, uh, one cannot, it's an incomplete matrix. But on second thought, one realizes that this is there's some structure in this matrix. These, the, these tastes are not fully random. Like if you like the return of the Killer Tomatoes part three, then it's likely to like another splatter movie say so there will be um linear dependencies in the rows of the matrix that is to say the matrix will have approximately low rank so can one recover a low rank matrix from fewer measurement and that's the statement of um matrix completion one surely cannot do arbitrary measurements, say with uh, measurements in the in the eigenbase of the matrix, one can be um, very unlucky. But here's a very plausible, extremely mild set of assumptions. So the following is true, that any matrix of rank R can be recovered using not of the order D squared, but only D log squared D. So 
die Polylog D times R randomly chosen measurements of Hilbert Schmidt um, scalar product type if AJ is a unitary operator basis. Again, the recovery is exact. It will um, only fail with an exponentially small probability. So if, if that should be quasi-deterministic, one can just take a few more um, data points. Also robust in that if the data is wrong, then the recovery is uh, slightly wrong, then the uh, recovery will also be only um, slightly slightly more. And um, so the, the most natural type of recovery of just minimizing the, the rank subject to the data given that's not feasible, that's an NP-hard problem, but the, the tightest possible relaxation, the minimization of the, of the one norm, trace norm, of the, of the nuclear norm, does allow for an efficient recovery. That's a semi-definite program, but in, in practice that can be even uh, beefed up um, still and made more efficient. And the moment of thought um, reveals that this is nothing but the, the the quantum state tomography problem that's encountered in the in the quantum uh, technologies because these uh, 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 most states are naturally low rank if they are close to being pure or well in, in some other way low rank and these Hilbert Schmidt scalar products are nothing but expectation values that are naturally accessible with the same type of experiment the same type of data the same type of setting after all where one makes use of the structure that's present in common states. And this is a, this, um, a, a powerful mathematical mach machinery behind, but this can also be uh, used in practice. So here this um, uh, citation here gives uh, a data from a trapped ion system with seven ions that makes use of this kind of compressed sensing machinery in uh, recovery. This is compressed sensing 2.0. So what is sometimes called compressed sensing 3.0 goes beyond that and thinks of recoveries of tensors, bilinear um, structures, where um, for our purposes, kind of recovering unknown components in the quantum technologies, maybe the presumably most important application is to learn about unknown quantum gates and to also acquire um, actionable advice on what to change if the the setting is not 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 quite quite right. And the first question is, after all, what sensible data is that are meaningful, robust, and um, appropriate. Now, what is most commonly used as a type of data is what is called randomized benchmarking data. That's a very clever and very kind of powerful setting and and, and mindset where one kind of makes use of a sequence of appropriate quantum gates, which are set up in a way that one measures the error rate by performing random circuits that would ultimately do nothing if the gates were perfect, making use of a, a group structure in, 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 the, in the setting. And the, the quantity, the quality quantity that assesses the quality um, of the quantum gates, the fidelity after all, would be the so-called average gate fidelity where one feeds in a state, one performs an average, a, a random state, one applies the gate and, and looks at the overlap with the same, uh, uh, with the same state as, as the output averaged over all, um, like high averaged over all possible. That's the average gate fidelity. It's also spam robust, like state preparation and measurement robust, which is the, the the setting that one wants to have because very much in the spirit of this of this talk the the preparation will not be quite perfect the the gates will not be quite perfect the measurement will not be quite perfect but under very mild iid assumption one can measure the average gate fidelity in such a setting having said that with the same type of experiment again with basically the same kind of data one can also um learn about a slightly more general type of data, namely generalized uh, average gate fidelity with respect to Clifford gates, where in the last step one doesn't undo the full thing to get the identity, but one allows to conjugate the outcome with with another Clifford gate. That said, it's just the, the same random setting interleaving gates with, with Clifford operations, but again, one just doesn't undo the, the the Clifford gate in the last step that's basically like a like a, a programming effort of, of, of in, in, in the same experimental prescription and one in the setting can collect noisy 
again, they will be not perfect, such average gate fidelities, um, like as many as, as um, the order of the, of the group. Now, these are sensible data. How can one learn uh, about the quantum gate in this fashion? And the interesting insight is one can learn fully and in a way that presumably fulfills all desiderata that one could possibly have in a recovery of unknown processes, so in, in, in process tomography in, in, in a way. So one makes use of um, average gate fidelity of this type, but not d to the power of 4 many, but of the order d squared log d many gate fidelities of randomly chosen Clifford gates. One just picks gates and, and uh, Clifford gates and, and uh, performs the respective uh, prescription to get the average gate fidelities will be good enough. They will suffice with high probability, um, exponentially large probability, in fact, to reconstruct any unitary um, gate. So with no further structural assumption, the recovery is um, stable in that the optimal solution is also guaranteed to fill, fulfill this error bound where the right hand side um, c contains the, the, the L2 norm of the respective uh, respective error. And again, this is um, a setting that makes use of only experimentally feasible uh, Clifford average gate fidelities of the same type in the same lab, the same setting, same experimentalist, the same type of data. And um, this is not only a, a recovery theorem, which it also is, but um, this also works um, in practice. So this plot here shows the recovery of a three qubit random gauge in a, in, a, in a practical setting. It's robust in the sense that one has a closeness in norm given a certain error level, but it's also spam robust in the sense that, again, the, the preparations, the measurements, the all aspects don't have to be quite perfect and one can still reliably estimate not only the, the plain vanilla average gate fidelity, but in fact the, the full quantum uh, uh, operation, the full quantum gate in a um, in an instance of process tomography. It's in, in all respects sample optimal. It, I mean, one cannot in, in, in the scaling improve the, um, the, the, the sample complexity and it exploits structure in that it's a quantum gate, so it has Krauss rank one if you want. Um, but otherwise um, makes no further um, structural assumption. And again, this uh, gives rise to actionable advice, meaning one gets the average gate fidelity, but on top of that, one would also get a deviation from the anticipated gate and would know what to change in the experimental setup to, um, to um, improve, or improve the setting. So the lesson is one can perform optimal quantum gate tomography in all figures of like that's optimal and all figures of merit that I, I can I, I think of with imperfect measurements again in the in the mindset of, of, of this talk nothing has to be quite quite right but not quite perfect but one can still perform quantum gate tomography in a reliable um, fashion again and then again this is not just a a kind of structure theorem that but this is the, the same sensible type of data imperfect data for that matter that would be say um, available in a trapped ion setting where we are just um, uh, elaborating on this in, in, in a practical um, setting. Which brings me to the second part of this talk, which um, pushes this idea, the main idea of the talk even a bit further, namely that of semi-device independent or maybe better semi-device dependent tomography of state recovery with imperfect detector. So again, in any reasonable prescription, if one is honest, neither the state, the prepared quantum state, nor the detectors aimed at learning the state after all can be or will be precisely no, there will be some quantum state that some source will produce and there will be detectors, they may be very accurate, very good, but there will be some parameters, some calibration parameters that would um, characterize the detector, some dark count rate, detector efficiency, whatnot, like a, a small number, like maybe a handful number per detector or, or, or less of calibration parameters that 
and characterize the detectors. So can we infer rho, the quantum state, without knowing these calibration parameters? And that's not so obvious, because if you don't know the calibration detector, uh, parameters, how can we learn about the state? So if you knew precisely about the state, we could learn about the parameters, that would be called detection, uh, detector tomography, fine, but we don't have that. But if we knew the calibration parameters, we could learn about the quantum state, but again, that would require the quantum state to be available. So this is clearly like a, a hen and egg problem that, I mean, uh, we need to have one part available after all. And the question we'd like to meditate in the following minutes is whether this is really set in stone or whether we could think or, or, or dream of some notions of blind self-calibrating tomography of, say, simultaneously inferring rho without knowing psi in the first. And again, that's different from... Um, uh, from detector tomography, where we would have to know the, precisely the, the, the state. This is not what we want to do um, here. So there are some steps have been taken towards notions of self-calibrating tomography, depending on, in, in some readings, most work is done in the, on, very much on the side of, of being very close to device independent in a kind of uh, a bell test um, inspired approach. Um, but um, what I would like to mention in the following is not heuristics as um, work is, that has been done um, in the past, but um, gives rise to recovery guarantee under certain settings. Um, and that's also practical in, in realistic settings. But before going there, um, again, a moment of thought reveals that this can only work. And I mean, in some readings, this has been noticed before, if some structure is present and that's a very basic counting argument that his, this has to be the case. So if one just counts the number of independent measurements needed to learn about a quantum state, there will be of the order d squared different uh, measurements. But the unknown parameters, um, so will have to be um, smaller than d squared minus uh, uh, 1 plus n, but well, I mean, some structural assumptions will be needed to make sure that one can even infer um, the setting with with a number of measurements um, at hand. So the some structural assumptions, assumptions are, are needed, but these are very reasonable structural assumptions after, after all. So again, um, the very natural assumption is that the state is approximately low rank or very pure and it was, had, had, would have rank one or like any low rank. This is, um, it seems fair to say, very... Um, reasonable in any kind of uh, preparation that seems interesting in the quantum uh, technologies. And the second assumption is that, again, I mean, I've basically verbalized that before, is that the calibration vector is sparse just by the detectors being characterized by some meaningful, uh, whatever, handful of, of, of numbers of meaningful quantities, but otherwise the, the overall functioning would be expected to be known. It's like a avalanche photodiode or whatnot. So some uh, uh, prescription that's given where some sparse calibration parameters are, are not. And finally, um, that the measurement model would depend linearly on these parameters. That's, again, let's state all the assumptions here. Um, ubiquitous, I mean, say if you have an uncalibrated tilt of some Hadamard or s gates or, or I mean, there's many settings in which this is very natural to have a linear dependence of the measurement model on the calibration uh, parameters. And the theorem that's um, here only informally stated, but in, the, in, in work that should come out any day, um, is, uh, is stated uh, more precisely, is that if A satisfies technical, um, but very plausible and often satisfy assumptions of, 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 of a restricted isometry property, that's basically some kind of um, incoherence property, after all, similar to the the assumption earlier that we have a unitary operator basis when measuring, then one can indeed, indeed, like in the in the Hilbert space dimension, efficiently recover it simultaneously both rho, the unknown quantum state, and the detectors in the same shot. So breaking the the hand and egg problem. 
and with a with a recovery guarantee. So, uh, how is this possible? And I will not go much, do much into detail here, but I will um, name some ideas um, that enter the enter the proof. So the the basic structure of the problem is again a um, compressed sensing type problem. Um, so basically, the the recovery problem is to recover an, a highly structured X that's um, a tensor product between sparse and um, a sparse vector and a, and a low rank matrix um, under a map A that is is, is a linear um, map. So in principle, one could think of just doing some sort of um, protective gradient descent, like iterative hard thresholding, subject to x being in 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 the many in the right manifold. That's very meaningful, but um, unfortunately, there cannot be a polynomial time algorithm to compute the the projective um, gradient for all x that have this um, structure unless uh, p is um, lp. That's a the the, the known um, sparse uh, PCA problem. But one can um, slightly relax the problem. So basically, the, the the signal sets of this blind tomography problem or sparse demixing problem can be regarded as um, um, subsets of like c to the power of n d times times d. So matrices that that are are consisting of n blocks of of d by d um, matrices. That's this omega s r n n d. That's relaxed to um, the a a a, a um, a setting omega um, tilde s r n d that that comprise of s non vanishing blocks, but with um, potentially different rank um, matrices, after all. And then one can efficiently compute the the, the projection uh, using hierarchical thresholding and also prove a recovery guarantee under um, under mild assumptions. And um, the lesson is while well, one has a recovery guarantee under very uh, weak and, and, and meaningful um, structural assumptions and structure is needed in any problem of this kind and also practically the lesson is is that it works well so the plot here shows um the recovery of like some random Pauli measurements on and uh, r qubits on this blind tomography setting compared to the um the, the kind of naive tomography that um makes uh, a, a stronger stronger assumption so the interestingly this hen and egg problem can be um, overcome. One can one can think of blind state tomography for uncharacterized detectors. So the detectors are uncharacterized. The states are not known. But using structural assumptions like sparsity of the detectors, basically low rankness of the state, both of which are meaningful, um, one can do both in the in the same shot. And blind state tomography is perfectly possible. Which brings me to the end of my talk. So if time allows this, I will be um, I'm looking at the at what we have achieved here in this talk and also how this all comes together in, in, in a somewhat um, ironic setting. So we set out to look at um, what we could call um, what we called optimal gate tomography. So tomography that makes use of sensible data, so randomized benchmarking type data which are, are anyway routinely taken in all the like Google, um, IBM, Regetti type settings uh, of interleaving um, a, a quantum gates in, in a sequence and getting be, being spam robust and with the same type of setting or experimental setting one can get acquire um, a data so that a spam, ro spam robust sample optimal, provably sample optimal and feasible quantum gate tomography is is um, is possible. Then we move further on to elaborate on um, blind uncalibrated tomography where the states are not known, the detectors are not known, um, but one can still semi-device independently or rather dependently characterize components and states in the same uh, in the same shot. So I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Structure is the key, and this is not this is a feature, not a bug. So structure will be present. Ideas of compressed sensing are featuring in both these approaches to plausibly make use of that structure, 
and in this either way uh, uh, performing optimal sample optimal gate tomography or um, uncalibrated tomography where without structure even based on basic counting arguments one cannot recover the problem at hand at all so in the in, in the last step let's zoom out a little bit and not look at components like gates quantum gates or states as as preparation prescriptions but at entire schemes so entire sampling based quantum advantage quantum supremacy schemes where some data are being presented where the question after all is not so much whether some step has worked or some preparation has been fine but whether one can efficiently verify the entire scheme like go into the lab and stare the data and stare at uh, judge from data alone whether the data is right and if the data are right then the, the green light would go on would say one would say yes one has achieved the experiment but if the noise levels are too high then one would say um well the noise levels are too high this has not quite quite worked so this is actually what is called a black box verification scheme of sampling experiment that spit out like data from a, well, a sampling setting where um, one uh, accepts the data if they're right or rejects them if the noise levels are too high so slightly or oh, uh, more pedantically put um, a black box certification test with some sample complexity would be an algorithm that would accept the um, setting in the hypothetical setting where uh, the data are perfectly right and would reject it if one is epsilon off in the total variation distance it would be efficient if this um, if polynomial in many samples would be taken but one can make use of an arbitrary and in fact even implausibly large or inefficient uh, computational effort so that's only on on sample complexity but not on on computational um, complexity and indeed many um, uh, um, distributions can perfectly be back, back box um, verified in such a in such a way if the distribution is not um, not too broad and, and, and concentrated one can in many settings perfectly well black box certify um, settings from polynomially um, many many samples so the um, the proof tool, ent proof tool entering here is maybe the the funniest norm I've, I've encountered ever is the p uh, min uh, minus max minus epsilon norm where one takes a distribution one uh, chops off the largest value of that distribution then the tail uh, summed up until epsilon and of the rest one takes the Renier two-thirds norm but that's the the key quantity that uh, um, enters the 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 the, the, the proof tool uh, the, 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 the setting and interestingly given this the setting one can see that these um, sampling settings of a um, quantum advantage type like boson sampling IQP circuits random circuits and so on they cannot be black box verified from polynomially uh, many many samples so one cannot just stare the data and judge from data alone efficiently whether the experiment um, has been, been right one again needs further assumptions in a, a, a plausible fashion but and and one could say well it is what it is i mean sure this is an exponentially large um, configuration space but on, on on this note it may be surprising to see that there are schemes like meaningful quantum advantage schemes quantum supremacy schemes that have a slightly stronger feature namely one can uh perform them they make use of only a unit time evolution under a 2d easing hamiltonian or one layer of like a unit depth circuit if you want one prepares product states applies a unit depth circuit of commuting gates or again equivalently a unit time evolution under a 2d easing hamiltonian that's basically a classical hamiltonian with commuting nearest neighbor hamiltonian terms and just local non-adaptive measurements um qubit measurements at the end of the day with a proven hardness statement up to constant errors in the total variation distance even with fine print of the proof of anti-concentration uh, being um settled as a proof not as an as an assumption um with a further cute property namely that it can be efficiently verified with 
with quantum detectors. One can take polynomially many measurements of a um, of a like of, of a local plausible type. And if the noise levels are too high, one would say, yeah, the noise levels are too high, one has to abort the setting. But if the if the noise levels are low enough, based on these data alone, one cannot build trust in the functioning or learn that it's kind of right and kind of okay. But one would really get a hard bound to the very same quantity that enters the complex theoretic argument and can kind of verify that one is that the distribution that one arrives at at the end of the day is really close in the total variation distance to the anticipated distribution. And then one would say, oh, so if if if, if the data is, is wrong, it, it, it noise levels are too 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 um too, too bad, and when the green light would the red light would go on. But if the green light goes on, I would say, great, I can verify, I can approve the setting and unambiguously so and would say, oh, but what's the outcome? Well, one doesn't know. One cannot predict the the sample, one can the sampling efficiency. One has to go into the lab, one has to do the experiment, but one can make take local measurements and sh make sure that the experiment is, 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 is right. So that's even philosophically interesting that one can verify the, the overall functioning of a prescription, taking efficiently many local measurements, and can say one is right, it's, it's doing the right thing, but to verify, uh, to, to predict what comes out, one has to do the, no, one cannot predict what comes out, one has to go into the lab, one has to the, do the sampling, but one can find out that the experiment is doing as doing the right thing. So there are schemes, quantum advantage schemes or quantum supremacy scheme, schemes, if you want, that are um, not black box, but efficiently quantum um, verified. So this brings me to the end of this talk. So I hope that it has become clear what the somewhat esoteric sounding title was all about on semi-device independent characterization. It's all about exploring an idea of characterization and benchmarking that could be called um, like fault tolerant inspired tomography. It's not quite the same setting, but it's a reasonable middle ground where the preparations are not perfect, the detectors are not perfect, all parts are not quite perfect, but in, like in, a, in, a, in a similar mindset than, than fault tolerant uh, quantum computing, make use of these realistic data and still be able to reliably benchmark, characterize, acquire tomographic knowledge, or even fully verify, um, in a way, holistically, an entire quantum scheme after all. So even if all components are not quite right, not quite perfect, one can still think of benchmarking, certification, and tomographic recovery in the quantum technologies. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Hope the recording quality was good enough and fine. Thank you very much for listening.